Good evening, brothers and sisters. I'm glad to be here with you tonight. Glad that I'm talking. I've been working, my wife and I, and someone just gave me something else here tonight for my voice, so I might be putting a little that in my mouth here and there. <laughs> we are talking about the mark of the beast when tonight. The mark of the beast when. Now, I expect to be able to get to when, but I don't know if I'm going to finish it. And if I don't, we will just pick up on Friday night because Friday night's subject will blend right in with tonight's subject anyway. But we will get a good ways into the when tonight. And we, the Lord just impressed me today. I need to put something on the front of this so that you'll fully understand uh, since we, we are in our what, week and a half now, we've covered a lot of things. I want to make sure we're on the same page. Um, so let's just open up our Bibles this evening to Matthew 24, verses 32. We're going to read three or four verses here. And before we read those verses, I'm just going to uh, refresh your mind on what Matthew 24 is about. Matthew 24 is about a prophecy dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem as well as the second coming. The disciples had asked Jesus when he was leaving the temple, and he told them that this temple that you're looking at, this marvelous uh, facility that you see here, and the white marble stones leading up to it, 400 feet in the air, Jesus had made, told, given a prophecy that there would not be one stone left upon another. And the disciples just reasoned in their mind that if there was going to come a time when this marvelous temple would be destroyed, that it must be the end of the world. And so they asked him, tell us, when shall these things be, meaning when will it be that this temple is going to be destroyed? What will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? For the reason that if Jerusalem was going to be destroyed, that it had to be the end of the world. He didn't, that was not his, his phrase, but that's what they, that was their question. So he obliged them and began to answer their question. And in answering their question, he gave a twofold prophecy a prophecy that would lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem that took place in 70 AD and a prophecy that would lead up to the second coming of Jesus. So it is a dual prophecy. And it has some very pertinent points in it. Uh, and he had said in there that when you see Jerusalem come past with armies, then know that it is time to flee. And in 66 AD, Jerusalem was compassed with armies by the Roman general uh, Titus, Sedius, rather. And history tells us that when Sedius pulled back, that the Christians escaped from Jerusalem. They believed the prophecy and got out. And then three and a half years later, Titus came back and he destroyed the temple. And just like God said, he he said there would not be one stone upon another left there. Uh, in the ensuing fight, the temple was built with cedar overlaid with gold. And Titus had said, spare the temple because the Romans had put so much money into this thing. Uh, it was a union of church and state, really, because Herod had built a tomb from his palace over to uh, the temple. And he had put a lot of money into it helping the Jews, you know, to beautify this facility. So Titus says, spare the temple, you know, make sure that don't, nothing happen to the temple. But in the fight, someone threw a fire brand in there and immediately it caught on fire. And as a result of the fire, the gold melted off of the cedars, burned to the ground, and it melted down through those beautiful stones. And the only way that gold could be retrieved is that every stone 
had to be knocked over. And Jesus had said that there will not be one stone left upon another that should not be thrown down. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. And see, this event is something, you know, it's still, like it happened 70 AD, but it still is recent for us, you know what I'm saying? It's not something that happened, uh, you know, 4,000 years ago. This is recent, this is something that would be considered you know, recent history, something, you know, it's right there. You can't, you can't deny it happened just like the Bible said it was going to happen. But in, the, in this discourse, he gives a twofold prophecy. So he gives the events that will lead up to this destruction of Jerusalem, and in that he's also get, telling you and I the events that will lead up to the second coming of Jesus. Do you believe Jesus is coming again, brothers and sisters? I believe this, saints. I believe it with all my heart. And I believe that it's very near. Now, in uh, verses 32, Matthew 24, 32, after Jesus has gone through some things here, he says, now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves. Ye know that summer is now. I want you to listen to Jesus. And Luke it says, when you see the leaves come out on the tree. When we see the leaves come out on the tree, we know that summer is now. We don't have to guess about it. We don't have to go and ask our neighbor what meaning these leaves. We know that some is not. Then he says, so likewise ye. When ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. And so Jesus now have given some signs that we will know that it's coming, it is near, even at the door. And the reason that you and I need to know this is because we have an enemy that's fighting against God that is wanting to prevent this from happening. And God has especially, let me show you tonight, God has especially given you um, some duties to do. Now, brothers and sisters, let us understand that we cannot set a date for the coming of Jesus. Are you with me, saying? For the next verse it says, 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels, but my Father only. So we can't, I cannot stand here and look at and study the Bible and, and explain to you and tell you that Jesus will be here uh, October the 5th, 2014. If I or anyone else tell you that, they're lying. That's a false prophet. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? But God has given us sign to let us know that he is near even at the door. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Now, we're talking about the mark of the beast when. We know what the beast is now. The beast is none other than the Bible ex exposes the beast as the Catholic Church that came on the scene. It is the system of the devil and rule from 538 to 1798. The mark of the authorities, they say, is that we transferred the solemnity from the seventh day Sabbath to the first day, which is Sunday, the sun's day. You know the history, at least I've explained some of that history to you, where it came from, what it's all about. And so this is going to be the object of contention here at the very end. We're going to get into that tonight. And I want you to understand this, brothers and sisters. Friday night, we're talking about whom will you serve. So we need to understand these things. Now, this is the word of God. It's not something that Moses Mason put together, anyone put together. This is the word of God. And we ought to study this book. We ought to understand it. The author of this book says, I wrote it 
and I'm going to tell you everything's going to happen. He says, I created the heavens and the earth. He says, now, because sin has entered this world, he says, I'm going to eradicate sin from this earth. And there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. Now, I believe that, brothers and sisters. Amen. And God says he's going to produce a people that will vindicate his character, will be able to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. He will prove that Satan is a liar. Are you with me? And so with that in mind, we're going to end into our study tonight. Now we're going to back up just a little. Well, maybe a good bit, because I want to, Lord just impressed me today as I was uh, studying that you need to back up and put something else in front of this. Uh, but we will get a good ways tonight. So we're going to get into our study let me go over to Revelation chapter 13. <laughs> Lord be with us, we need you. In Revelation 13, we see a beast come up in verse 1. We've talked about him. This beast is none other than the little horn of Daniel 7. It is the Catholic Church that comes on the scene. It is the fifth head of Revelation, the 17th chapter, that speaks blasphemies, that says that they can forgive sin and that the Pope is God on earth and that if necessary, they could excommunicate the angels from heaven. They have said that they think that they can change times and laws. The Bible completely identifies this problem. And so, but the Bible says that he would rule for 1260 years, and true enough he did, that he would pluck up three horns, true enough he did. And when that third horn was plucked up, his rule began in 538. But the Bible says that he would receive a deadly wound. We have discovered that that power was a, was a union of church and state. It used the civil powers to do its killing, and in done those 1260 years, it killed 50 to 100 million people, and this is an undeniable fact. But the Bible says he would receive a deadly wound, but his deadly wound would be healed, meaning that there would be another union of church and state, because when another union of church and state comes, then that deadly wound is going to be healed. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? The Bible goes on to say in Revelation 13, when his daily wound is healed, verse 3 says, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So now that tells me that when the deadly wound is healed, when this union of church and states come back, that the whole world will bow down to it. All the world were one after the beast. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Now, in verses 11, in this same chapter, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. We have discovered that to be the United States of America that comes on the scene like a lamb with Christ-like virtues. But the Bible says that America would speak as a dragon. And Revelation 12:17 says that the dragon persecutes and prosecutes those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which we have discovered is the gift of prophecy. And so therefore, America, when America speaks as a dragon, she would have to again persecute and prosecute those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Are you with me saying? Now with that in mind, we want to, give a little, we want to do a little history. Give me my screen now. Thank you, brothers. Thank you. All right, the Margaret of Beast swim. Let's give a little history here, just a little history. When Satan saw that he was kicked out of heaven in Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says in verses 10, Revelation chapter 12, verses 10, it says, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come, what? Salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. 
For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused him before God day and night. When Jesus died on the cross, Satan now was banned from heaven for good. He could not, no, not go back and harass and do and stick his chest out and what have you anymore. And the Bible says, now is come salvation and strength. Because Romans 5, 6 says, when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So when Christ died on the cross in 31 AD, then came salvation and strength. And Satan's game plan is to prevent you and I from tying into that power source made available at the cross. And that's the reason diked, getting your diet correct is so important. Because if your diet is not right, you're not going to be able to tie into that power source. And Satan knows that. All right, let's talk. But then in verse 12 says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And so as we look at our screen tonight, as we look at the screen, we see that Satan was kicked out. Pentecost, we talked about Pentecost, and Pentecost comes. And for three and a half years from the cross over to the stone of Stephen's, the Jews had those three and a half years to accept Christ, and they did not. And so the Bible tells us, therefore rejoice you heavens and ye that dwell in them, woe to the heavens of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that it happened a short time. So once Jesus died on the cross, Satan went about now to persecute <coughs> and prosecute everyone that would accept Jesus' death on the cross. And he started with the disciples. So you with me, brothers and sisters? He had to say, I got to get rid of the disciples. So he started with them, trying to eliminate them. All right? He says, I only have a short time. So, but, but then this goes on from 34 AD now, right here, all the way out to 476 AD, because when Jesus died on the cross, the Roman world was ruling. The, the fourth head was ruling. And we know that Rome began to fall in 351 AD. It took 125 years for the Roman Empire to be broken up into 10 nations. After that 125 years, when the dust was sold, Rome had been broken up into 10 nations. And so the fall of the Roman Empire is right here. And just like the prophecy said, it was broken up into 10 nations. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? All right. And then from 476 AD, there's three horns. What was those horns? Anybody remember those horns? Hurley, Vandals, and Arthagos were destroyed between 476 and 538. When that last horn, the Arthagos was destroyed in 538, the papacy came on the scene as that power because before then, those three horns was holding it in check and it could not have the liberty to do what it wanted to do. So when Justinian gave the decree in 533 that the Pope should be over all the holy churches, there was still one power left, two powers left, rather. And so he had to destroy the Vandals in 534 and the Arsenal in 538. And then the papacy came into full control. Are you with me? And so we then enter the, what? The Dark Ages. Are you with me, saints? All right. Let's go into the Dark Ages. Now, as we get into the Dark Ages, what was the plan of salvation? Where was it found? If you were Satan, what would you do? What would you do? Huh? No, if the, if the, if, if the, if the plan of salvation is in the sanctuary, if that's going to die away, oh God, is where? If you were Satan, what would you do? You're trying to get rid of that, that knowledge right there, right? Because this is going to give you everything. First face, second face. You, wouldn't you try to get rid of that? So Satan, as we go into the dark ages, Satan moves to get rid of the Bible. If you get rid of the Bible and put up a false system, no one's going to have access to Christ. They even know anything about the plan of salvation. Are you with me, Satan? Now this is very, this is very, we must understand this this evening. And so, 
what we have been talking about here, as it moved into the dark ages, let me show you what happened. Look at the screen. Slowly, slowly, that truth disappeared. Are you with me saying? Slowly, it was a slow process, but that truth finally disappeared. And Satan put in place another plan of salvation. Are you with me saying? We put this up. So he, he directed man to man. We talked about this last night, right? He directed man to man to give forgiveness for his sin. He set up the way for God, this false system, and says that God, we put God in here. And we can carry him around. We can do whatever we want with him. So we talked about this. I'm going to go right on past that. You all, we already talked about it. So that's 394. He did that. Pontiff, which is pagan. Then Satan burned the Bibles. He made the Bibles illegal. No one had a Bible. Can you imagine not being able to have a Bible? No one had a Bible. It was illegal to have a Bible. You had a Bible, they would kill you. And then the only someone who could have a Bible was the, the priest, and it was in a language that could not be understood. And in the monasteries, even in the monasteries, there was only one Bible. And so Martin Luther would go to this one Bible that was changed to a post and read. And as he read, he began to see that what the Catholic Church was teaching and, and advocating was totally contrary to what was in the Word of God. Amen. Are you with me, Saint? Yes. So he said, something's wrong here. So he thought, this is my church. This is my beloved church. Surely, if I tell them, they're going to want to do what's right. But let's move on. So God brought on a, a man on the scene by the name of John Wesley. He was the bright and morning star. God used him to start now you hear me tonight. What, what is known in history as the Protestant Reformation. Anybody ever heard me see it? Make sure everybody has heard what a Protestant. I want to see your hand. If you don't know what a Protestant Reformation is, hold your hand up. Just, don't be ashamed. Everybody, everybody here knows what the Protestant Reformation is. If I should just arbitrarily call on someone, would you be able to stand and tell me? Because you know I'll do that. So everybody here, so I went there and I tell you what I want. I want some brave soul, since you're going to have to stand before council, I want some brave soul to stand and tell me what is the Protestant Reformation. Come on, come on. Someone tell me. So you're not going to get away with this. Deacons, lock the doors. Nobody's going home tonight until somebody get up and tell me what the Protestant Reformation is. Someone stand up and tell me what is the Protestant Reformation. All right, going against the Catholic Church, huh? Against the doctrines of the Catholic Church. All right, anybody want to add to that? Okay, the Bible should be the rule of faith. What does the word Protestant mean? Protest. All right, I want to get that out of you. So why, Cliff? started the protests against the false pagan doctrines of the Catholic Church. And he translated the Bible, this was one of the translations of the Bible, into something, a language where people could understand it. So he started this thing. Are you with me saying? So now, they, he started the protest. So now, this protest is what brought all the other churches into existence. Now, let's look at it. There's Martin Luther, nailing a 95 thesis to the Church of Wittenberg. 95, in other words, as he studied the Bible, he found 95 things in the Bible that, the, that, that, that was contrary to what the church was doing. Are you with me saying? So, and it was more, but that's what he found. Now, remember, I want you to remember, the truth, now this is 1517, the truth has now been thoroughly lost. Nobody knows anything about a sanctuary. That's where the whole plan of salvation is. This is what God is going to do. Nobody knows anything about this. All right? John Wesley, 
comes on the scene as a reformer. And John Wesley discovers truth in the Bible. And John Wesley starts the, what church? The Methodist Church. Now John Wesley finds a piece of truth. Are you with me? He doesn't find all of it, but he finds a piece of truth. And he starts a church. Are you with me saying? He starts a denomination. He doesn't, he doesn't discover the sanctuary, but he discovers some truth. And he breaks away from the Catholic Church. Now, and he starts the, what's called the Methodist Church. And, it's, and this is a godly man. And so, but when he died, the Methodist Church died with him. You know what I mean? What I mean is that they did no more searching. What, where Wesley was is where they stopped. Are you with me saying? Martin Luther, who, who, who is credited with starting the, the Worldwide Reformation, found truth, lots of truth. But Martin Luther was a good man. But Martin Luther could cuss like a sailor. He never stopped drinking beer. Because he didn't know that. He, because all the priests drank beer and looked at him was drunk all the time. So he never learned that from the Bible that, you know, a strong drink is a mock. He never learned that. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So, but he was a good man. And the Bible says, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him to sin. But he did all that he knew to do. So he died knowing what he had found. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So he came up with the just shall live by faith. And the just shall live by faith, brothers and sisters. He discovered that. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Then, <coughs> John Knox was a man of a student of, of the Revelation. Oh, in, in the book, he wrote, had a little notes. He used to write notes. And uh, when he died, they, they gave they wrote a book called Notes on Revelation because in, you see, 1754, Knox said that the two horned beasts of Revelation 13, verses 11, have not yet come. I said 1754. He says the two horned beasts of Revelation 13, 11, has not yet come, but it cannot be far away, for it will come at the end of the 1260 days. So he knew, man, he was studying the Bible, he was studying Revelation, and he knew that the two horned beast which represents America had to soon come on the scene. He didn't know who it was, but he knew that it had to soon come on the scene. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? John uh, Calvin came on the scene, and Calvin discovered that a Christian need to be baptized. He found this in the Bible. And so he started the Baptist. Now I want you to understand what's going on here, Saint. All these Protestant denominations that came on the scene protesting discovered a piece of truth. And they started a church. Are you with me, brother and sister? Are you following me tonight? All right, let's go. And so here is a just a kind of history of it as, as it went. Each one passed the baton to the other. And here is the baton being passed to this hand here. And here's a man out here by the name of William Miller. In 1825, he began to study the Bible. And he was studying, actually he was what's known as a theist. Theist, rather. And a theist, believed that, yes, God created the world, but he left it and went on about his business, left it to itself. But as he began to take his Bible and a concordance and began to study the word of God, when he got down to Daniel 8.14, he came to the conclusion that Daniel 8.14 says, unto 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be clean. He came to the conclusion as he studied that the sanctuary was the earth. And he figured it out that 
1844, first he said 1843, but then he got it correct, 1844, he says that Jesus was coming back and cleanse the earth because now, remember, the sanctuary of truth is lost. The very pattern, the very plan of salvation is lost, brothers and sisters. Nobody knows anything about it. And so when William Miller, a student of the word of God, began to study and came up with Daniel 8, 14, it says unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be clean. He, he, the, the, the common belief then was that the earth was a sanctuary. They knew, nobody knew anything. Wesley didn't know anything about a sanctuary. Knox didn't know anything about it. Luther didn't know anything about it. Calvin, none of those reformers knew anything about a sanctuary. It had never been discovered. It had been lost during the dark ages. Are you with me, saints? So naturally, when William Miller began to study and, and, and came up with this, he thought that the earth was the sanctuary, and this 2,300 days that the, earth, that the sanctuary would be cleansed, meaning that the, that, that the earth would be cleansed, so he reasoned that Jesus was going to return to this earth in 1844. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Now, we know he didn't come because we're still there, right? <laughs> And that was a grand movement the world over. It wasn't just not in America, it was the world over. That was a grand movement that Jesus was coming, October 22nd, 1844. There were 50,000 people in America that came out of various denominations looking for Jesus to come. They were selling everything they had. They were looking for Jesus to come. Are you hearing me tonight, Saint? You need to understand this. If we want to find out what this market of beast is, we ain't done. Don't you want to know, Saint? So, they were looking. Now, Reformation, passing the baton. Great light was given to the Reformers, but many of them received this history of error through misinterpretation of the scripture because simply, they simply did not know. These was good men. They were used by God. These errors have come down through the centuries because these men, they believed that when you died, you went straight to heaven. These men believed that there was a burning hell forever. These men even believe in purgatory. Because it's what the church had taught you. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Let's continue. But although they be hoary with age, yet they have not behind them a thus said the Lord. For the Lord has said, I will not alter the thing that is going out of my lips. In his great mercy, the Lord has permitted what? Still greater light to shine where? in these last days. To us, he has sent his message revealing his law and showing us what is true. The reformers, these reformers knew nothing about the law. The only law they knew about was the catechism. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Do you understand what I'm saying here? They knew nothing about no law of God. All of this was lost during the dark ages. But God says, I'm going to fix that. They believe that the earth was a sanctuary. They knew nothing about a heavenly sanctuary. Even though it's right there, but they, you know, remember, they didn't have Bibles at first. So they thought the earth was a sanctuary. And so that was passed on to William Miller. But then when Jesus did not come in 1844, and the pioneers of this church that 50,000 had come out and was looking for Jesus to come. When Jesus didn't come October 22nd, 1844, that 50,000 were reduced to 50. Are you hearing me, saints? But that 50 said, wait a minute. As they looked at that prophecy, you see that 2,300-day prophecy is broken up into sections. The first part of that prophecy says that Jesus would come and be baptized in 27 AD when you figure it out. And they looked in the Bible and the history and said, Jesus did come and was baptized in 27 AD. That prophecy says that Jesus would start in ministry, but he would be cut off in the middle of the week. 
which would be 31 AD. They looked in history and found that Jesus was cut off. He went to the cross in 31 AD. And the Bible says that he would cause the sacrifice. Listen to what I'm saying here, saying. The Bible says that he would cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease. Now, we're going to go to 924 later on. And, you, and they looked in the Bible in history and they said, he did cause the, 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 the sacrifice and oblation to cease in 31 AD. It did happen. The Bible says that the Jews had until 34 AD to accept Jesus. And they went in history in the Bible and found out that the Jews rejected Jesus in 34 AD and stoned Stephenson. So they said, this has all happened. So why didn't Jesus come in 1844? Why didn't he come? Everything else worked out. So they said, now, let's find out. So they went now and they studied. And they discovered, brothers and sisters, that the earth was not the sanctuary, but that there was a heavenly sanctuary. And that the text that said unto 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed was Jesus moving from the holy to the most holy. Because when he left here in 31 AD, he went to the holy to plead his blood as our mediator. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? But that has to be a third to final phase of this plan of salvation. He has to move from the holy to the most holy. So that's what he did in 1844. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So when the pioneers discovered that, here's Hiram Edison looking up and, and God revealed this thing. This is what the, the pioneers of this church said. They said the passing, listen to this thing, saints. The passing of the time in 1844 was a period of what? Great events. Done what? Opening to what? Out of astonished eyes. Now wait a minute, let me get you. Hold on. Stop right there. Why were their eyes astonished? Come on, talk to me. Why did they say opening to our astonished eyes. Wait a minute, if, if I pull, let me tell you, let me ask you, let me question. If I went in my pocket right now and pulled out $5 million and gave it to one of y'all, would your eyes be astonished? Come on, now, talk to me. Tell me why did they say opening to our astonished eyes. Why? Huh? Somebody tell me. It was new. All of a sudden they recognized the earth is not the sanctuary. There is a sanctuary in heaven. So when they saw that, their eyes was astonished. Are you with me saying? So it says, opening to our astonished eyes, the cleansing of the sanctuary. It wasn't cleansing of this earth. It was cleansing of the sanctuary. It was cleansing, as they did on the devil, telling them, cleansing the sins from the sanctuary. Transpired in heaven and having a side of relation to God's people upon the earth. Also, they discover the first and second and third angels' message unfurling the banner which was inscribed the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. All this was discovered in the sanctuary. And you remember that third angel says, if any man worship the beast and his image, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. So they discovered this. Are you hearing me say? Let's go. One of the landmarks under this message was the temple of God seen by his truth loving people in heaven. And the ark, listen, at, listen, what does what? And the ark containing the law of God. Now, don't forget that. The ark containing the law of God, the light of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, flesh is strong rays in the pathway of the transgressors of God's law. The non-immortality of the wicked is an old landmark. And she says, I can call to man nothing more that can come under the head of the old landmarks. Now, what did she say? She says, the ark doing what? Containing what? The law of God. Let's go to Exodus. Now, I hadn't forgotten my purpose here tonight, saints. What time is it? 20 minutes and nine. But I'm following the Holy Spirit. So y'all hang with me. In Exodus 25,
the Bible says in Exodus 25, verses 8, and let them do what? That I may dwell among them. And then he says, 25 verses 21, he says, 25, 21, he says, well, let's start up at, let's start up at uh, uh, 10 first. And they shall make an ark of what? Shittim wood, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. So from verse 10 down to 20, it talks about the building of this ark. Then verse 21 says, let's read verse 21 together. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give you thee. That testimony is the Ten Commandments. Let's go to 31, Exodus 31, verse 18. 31, verse 18. I want us to get this thing. Now, please forgive me, but, but, but the Lord told me, say, this is what you have to do. Exodus 31, verse 18, what does it say, saints? And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communion with him upon Mount Sinai, what? Two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with what? Now, I want you to understand, who wrote, who wrote the Ten Commandments? God wrote, please understand this, God wrote the Ten Commandments. And the Bible tells me that this is the law of God. And it tells me that sin is the transgression of this law. Adam broke this law when he partook of that fruit. God says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. This law has always been, now it was written in Exodus, but the law has always been, because you cannot sin without the law. You can go down the road doing, if there's no law, speeding law, you can go down the road driving 900 miles an hour, but you're not speeding because there's no law. It, you, can, you can only break the law when there is a law to be broke. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? But when you put a law out there, then that's when you break it, when you go past it. So sin originated in heaven, which we've already discovered, so the law was in heaven. Sin is the transgression of God's law. And so Satan is against God's law. Now we know that when, when um, Moses came down off the mountain. The people were dancing around the calf, and he broke the first uh, law. He threw them down and broke them. And God told him, come back up into the mountain, and I'm, I'm going to heal you some more stones, and I'm going to write it again. So let's go over to Exodus 34. Exodus 34, verses 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Heal thee two tables of stone, like unto the first, and I will what? Write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, which thou breakest, and be ready in the morning. And he did, and he went up, and then God uh, wrote the Ten Commandments again. Now, where were they to put these Ten Commandments? In the, in the ark. All right, now here's Moses up. The Ten Commandments is being written. Here he's come down with him, and he told him to take him and put him in the Ark. Now, I put a few pictures up there of the ark. People all kind of have all kind of renditions of the ark. And so this is one rendition of the ark right there. All of them have the, the two cherubims on the side. That's another rendition of the ark. That's another rendition of the ark. And there's the final one. That's, this one has the, the, the staves going up, up, you know, crossway. But the law was to be put on the inside of the ark. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? All right. So let's put God's law on the inside of the ark. Now watch now. Let's go to Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 4. The Bible says, We're looking at verses 12. Deuteronomy 4 is a book of repeating, and what God has done here is repeating all that has happened uh, before Moses dies. So Moses is telling the children of Israel what, what all have taken place, what have transpired since they left Egypt. 
He says here, verse 12, And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only you heard a voice. Verse 13, And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. What were they? Even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. So God wrote the commandments upon two tables of stone. What does it call? His covenant. Now look at verse 14. And the Lord commanded me at that time to do what? Teach you statutes and judgments that you might do them in the land whether you go over to possess it. So God wrote the Ten Commandments and told him to put them where? On the inside of the ark. But he says, I want you to, I want you to write these these ordinances and things. So let's find out about these ordinances. Let's go over to Deuteronomy 31. Listen, look at this thing that says. Look at this. We look at 31.24. The Bible says, And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law, what? In a book. Until they were finished. Now who's writing this stuff in a book? Moses. That Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, do what? Take this book of the law and put it where? in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God that it may be there for a what? Now, look, up the, look at the screen, saints. The Ten Commandments went there, right? But he says, I want Moses to write something and I want you to put it, I want him to put it in the side. So there was a pocket on the side of the ark. And that was called the book of the law. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Now, the reason I want to bring this out tonight, because people will say, because when we talk about the mark of the beast win, people will say that the Ten Commandments was Moses' law. It's God's law. Now, I'll tell you the truth, both of them God's law, because Moses wouldn't know how to write anything in a book unless God told him what to write. But the thing with it is, God wrote the Ten Commandments, and Moses wrote the stuff in the book. Now, let me show what, what, what were these two things about. Let's, let's go a little bit further. This is called the book of the law. There it is, a scroll. Now, what was this book of the law? We need to understand what this book of the law was. That's a, that's a cutaway of the, of, the, of the sanctuary. Holy place, and most holy place. And there's the ark in the most holy place. You see that, saints? And there's the book, the, the pocket on the side for the book of the law. That's where the thing that Moses wrote. Now, what is this book of the law? Let's see. Here's God's law on the left because he wrote it. And here's Moses' law on the right. Are you with me? Now, remember... God wrote the Ten Commandments, and Moses wrote the book of the law. Now, both of them are instruments of God. It's just that two different people wrote them. I mean, God wrote one, Moses, and he had Moses write the other one. So the book of the law is what we would call Moses' law. Are you with me, saying? Now, let's see, what is this? God's law, whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Are you with me saying? So what is Moses' law? If you broke, if you sin, then you had to appeal over here to find out what to do. Are you with me saying? So what Moses' law was, if you sin, then God told Moses to write down, if they sin this way, they got to bring this kind of offering. If they sin this, if they do this, they got to bring this kind of offering. If they do this right here, they got to do this. Moses' law simply instructed them what to do if they broke God's law. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? And also told them how they were to eat, how they were to drink, how they were to carry in their religious service. Told them all of this. Are you with me, saying? So now look. So here is Moses' law. It had sin offerings, meat offerings, drink offerings. Holy days. There was a lot of holy days in there. Ordinances. 
Now here's a final thing. Look at this. Look at the screen. There were seven ceremonial Sabbaths in Moses' law. Now we talked about this. Ceremonial Sabbath didn't come on the seventh day Sabbath, they came on a particular date. Are you with me, saints? Seven of them. So when you go over to Colossians, let's go over to Colossians. Colossians 1. All right, Colossians 1, 2, I'm sorry, Colossians 2. The Bible says, Colossians 2, we want to look at, we're going to start at verses 11. Let's start at verse 11. The Bible says, in whom also ye are circumcised, that was in Moses' law, with the circumcision made without hands in putting of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Verse 12, bear it with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespass. Now look at the next verse. Let's read it together. Blotting out the handwriting of what? Ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way doing what? Nailing it to his cross. So what did he take out the way? The ordinances. What else? What else is it? And having spoiled principalities and powers, talking about Satan, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Verse 16, what does it say? Let no man therefore judge you in what? Meat are uh, in drink, are uh, in respect of an holy day, are uh, of the new moon, are uh, of the Sabbath days. So people that don't understand the word of God, don't understand the sanctuary, will think that this is mean, well, you don't have to keep no Sabbath day no more. This is talking about Moses' law. When Christ died on the cross, 924, all of these things was done away with. We don't have to bring a lamb anymore. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? We don't have to keep new moons and holy days. We don't have to do that. All those ceremonial holy days that they took, we don't have to do that anymore. All of this was nailed to the cross. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? It's gone. Sin offerings, gone. Meat offerings, gone. Drink offerings, gone. Holy days. Go, those ceremonial holidays is what we're speaking of. Ceremonial Sabbaths, go. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? But God's seven day Sabbath is here. Now, what, what does Jesus say? He says, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So, how did he fulfill it? Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. So Jesus came and paid the price for the sins of Adam and all of us down through here. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Do you understand this tonight? Now you are ready to understand the mark of the beast win. You weren't ready before, but you're ready now. <laughs> you weren't ready before. Now you're ready. And we have... I got, according to my time, I got 35 minutes. That's the same time you had. <laughs> All right, let's go. America. Number seven. Speaks as a dragon. Now, if America's going to speak as a dragon, we must, there must be some signs. The Bible says when you see these signs, look up for your redemption drawing that. Now, we know that America speaking as a dragon has to take place before Jesus comes, doesn't it? So then we're going to see some things tonight that lets us know that absolutely Jesus is getting ready to come. Now I want you to go to Genesis right quick.
Let's go to Genesis. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, and we want to look at verses 26. Genesis chapter 1, I want you to get this, brothers and sisters. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cow and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God says, I'm going to make man in our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So God made them which way? Male and female. And what did he tell them to do? To be fruitful and multiply. So they were in God's image, right? So in the image of God, they could be fruitful and multiply. And then once God did this, then he rested on the seventh day. And he put himself in the seventh day. He blessed the seventh day and he held it. And so we see here at the creation, the creation of man and the creation of the Sabbath goes hand in hand. These are two of the institutions at the very beginning. Are you with me? Marriage and the Sabbath. Marriage and the Sabbath. Are you with me, saints? All right. You got that. You got to put that on your desktop now. Let's move forward. We had said earlier that there's four things here is going to lead to us having a national Sunday law. We said that the morals must go down. Is that right? Calamities will go up. National deficit will go up. Temporal prosperity will decrease. Results will be national chaos. Solution would be a mandatory return to God in the form of a national Sunday law. If America passes a national Sunday law, then she will be speaking as a dragon. So our subject tonight is Mark of the Beast when? All right, so the Bible tells us in Genesis, I mean in, in, in Matthew 24, he tells us, the Bible tells us rather, that as Jesus began, laid out the events that would lead up to his second coming, look what he says. He says, they asked him, when, when shall these things be? What should be the sign of the coming of the end of the world? In verse 4, Matthew 24, 4, and Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 7, for nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And verse 8 says, what does verse 8 say? All these are the beginning of sorrow. Then what does verse 9 say? Then shall they deliver you up to be a what? And shall and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now, this is all nations, brothers and sisters. Now, early on, we talked about this. Does anyone in here remember what happens between verses 8 and verse 9? I heard somebody to my left over here say, dear sister says, a Sunday law. We went through this. We went through this in detail. Between verse 8 and 9 is the Sunday law. That's what, that's the reason... The, the calamities and everything is the beginning of sorrow, but these calamities lead to what? The passing of a Sunday law. That's one of the things that's leading to the passing of a, but it's a conglomeration of things. You see these things? You see these things? 
All of these things are going to lead to this. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So now let's look at some of these things. Let's look at this. All right, we, we talked about the morals. We, saw, we found out that in the French Revolution, what happened? They took God out. When they took God out, what happened to the morals? So in 1962, what did America do? And so we've seen, we, we showed you, just from taking out the moral star to the decline. Now we're going to take it a little further tonight. Matter of fact, we're going to take it a good bit further. First of all, let's look at the calamities that's taking place. All right, calamities must increase. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Global disasters for 2013. And I, you know, I'm speaking to the, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. I'm sure you all are aware of all the global disasters that's taking place. But let's just look at a few of them. Disasters. Floods of every kind is taking place. More disasters. Fire, forest fires burning up tons of acres. Mudslides. I mean, it's unreal the mudslides is taking place. Sinkholes, all the streets, it, the big holes just falling out, out, of, out of the earth. Just calamities of every kind is taking place. And they're happening all over the world. I started plotting this stuff. And from 1989, Hugo, Andrew, the California earthquake, before Hugo, we didn't have a natural disaster to toll $1 billion until Hugo came along with $6.2 billion, Andrew, 30, $32.6 uh, billion. The first floods in, in, the, in the Midwest was $21.4 million, then $18.6 billion, rather. And then Katrina was $87 billion. And I stopped counting after that. I said, look, it's here. So the calamities are everywhere, and they're so bad, saints, that even Life magazine says the year of Kilauea, why has nature gone mad? So the world recognizes that something is wrong, something is amiss. Are you with me, saints? Now look, look what the prophet says. Look what it says here. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both man and beast. GC 590. Now here's the key. The people believe that the disasters are caused by God. Are you with me, saints? The people believe that the disasters are being caused by God but they're being caused by the devil. He is the prince of the air. He is the one that's done the destroying. Are you with me? So he is playing both ends against the sinner. He has caused the morals to go down. Now he sends the calamities in order to bring about his desired results. Are you with me, saints? Now watch what's going to happen. Watch it. So floods, fires, droughts, and storms, they're calling it acts of God. The insurance come to cause it acts of God. Now I want you to think about something, brothers and sisters. Your, your stealth bombers and all your armor, your military armors can't do anything to stop these disasters. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So you can have all the standing army you want, but you, your standing army can't stop this, these disasters. So they're going to have to appeal to something else to stop this. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Watch it. Watch it. Look what this says. This was no tornado. This was God taking a wrecking ball to our town. This is what the people believe. They think all of this is being done by God. Now you know why? The, what the religious writer began, uh, began to say? Go to, go to 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. Let's see what they said. Let's go. Let's see what they said. 2 Chronicles 7.14. This is, the, this is what they're repeating now. 2 Chronicles 7.14. Yeah, my people. Do we see it, saints? What does it say? Yeah, my people who are called by my name will do what? Will humble themselves and do what? And pray and do what else? And, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I heal their land. This is what the religious right are saying. There, now watch it, brothers and sisters. Let's go. So what else has to happen? Morals must come down, calamities must go up, and your temporal, I said, your federal 
uh, when thing will go up and your temporal prosperity will come down. The national deficit will go up and your temporal prosperity will go down. Now look what this says. Since the U.S. dollar lost its, its last bit of redeemability in gold in 1971, I wish we had time to really get into this, the supply of dollars has exploded along with the national debt, causing a loss of 75% in buying power. Intelligent, conservative Americans are making the move back to constitutional fund and biblical currency in greater numbers. And the key is, it says, the, the, the more money you print, the less the value in your pocket. Now, right now, America is spending 85, putting $85 billion into the economy every month to keep the economy from buckling. We're printing this money, we're just rolling it off. At the rate of $85 billion a month. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Now look at here. The Federal Reserve note has been steadily debased since the inception of the Federal Reserve. Paper bills have depreciated from full gold redeemability to flimsy promissory notes with no collateral. The potential buying power of the dollar goes down as the national debt goes up. The Federal Reserve note has been steadily debased since the inception of the Federal Reserve. Paper bills have depreciated from full gold redeem redeemability to flimsy promissory notes with no collateral. The potential buying power of the dollar goes down as the national debt goes up. All right? In 1980, America had a $985 billion deficit. We didn't even have one trillion dollars in deficit. Now, up until 1913, we paid off our bills every year. But when the Federal Reserve came in and allowed them to print money, 1980, we was at $985 billion. And Ronald Reagan says, if you will elect me president, I will balance the budget. Now, Ronald Reagan did not understand that prophecy was at play. So let's just see now what has happened. So here we are, 1980. So when Ronald Reagan came on the scene, he, he inherited that say his, that dollar was worth a dollar in 1980. It was not, but let's say it was worth a dollar in 1980. Well, when he left office, look what the, what the deficit was at. What was it at? 3.1 trillion. So let's devalue the dollar accordingly. So let's devalue that dollar. So when he leaves office, that dollar is worth 33 cents. That's the buying power. You understand what I'm saying here, saints? All right. And then first Bush came on the scene. So he inherited the, 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 the dollar that Ronald Reagan left. But when he left, the deficit was at 4.2 trillion. So we got to now devalue the dollar some more. And, and, and look, this is a fact. This will, listen, you don't have to, this is no, no prophecy. This is happening right before your very eyes right now. So you don't, we, don't, we don't have to guess about this. It's going on right now. And this is prophecy. The prophet said this would happen. So we're living it. We don't have to pull up no history, none. No, we are living it right now. Let's go. And then... My man here that never inhaled came on the scene. <laughs> and he inherited George Bush Warren's dollar. But from under him, it went to six trillion. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, Saints. This was fulfilling a prophecy. There's nothing these men could do, to be honest with you. But we want you to see what's happening prophetically. Because, Saints, I'm going to tell you right now. All of the found movement started in 1980. That's something else I had to get with you later on. So when he left office, this is what the dollars, you see what the dollars worth now? And then came George Bush too. So he inherited Clinton's dollar. And when he left office, the deficit was at 11 trillion. So, now, Saints, this is a prophetic fact that we are living right now. The temporal prosperity must go down. 
and to the point of where only a few people will have all of the money. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Now, Bill Gates is never going to be suffering. But it's going to be that class, that 95%. That's what's going to happen. Now, saints, whether you know it or not, the same thing is happening here. It's happening worldwide. It's worldwide. There is an economic crisis worldwide. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Then the one came on. The one that's going to fix everything. He came. Now, again, I'm not picking on these guys. They, they are, listen, they're dealing with prophecy. It cannot be fixed. It cannot be fixed, brothers and sisters. Under him, it jumped to $17 trillion. And right now, saints, within five days, I believe, the government in America is threatened to be shut down unless they can raise the debt ceiling. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? And still we are printing $85 billion a month. We're just printing it. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just print your money? And, and, anytime you need some money, just go print you some. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, that's what America is doing. To the tune of 80, and the only, it's all because we believe America. Are you with me, saints? So this is prophecy that's being fulfilled right before our very eyes right now. And let me tell you something, saints, now, you, let's go in our Bible. Let's go in our Bibles. Let's go in our Bibles. Let me see what my time is. We're in Matthew chapter 24, brothers and sisters. Now, as Jesus gives these signs, watch what Jesus does now. Lord, please, please make this plain. I cannot make it plain, Lord. You have to make it plain. Now, this is what Jesus says as he's given the signs. He says, verse 29, Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. Give me a date. Shall the sun be dark? 17, 8, okay. And the moon shall not give her light. No, that, that same night. And the star shall fall from heaven. And what's going to happen? And the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That's the second coming. Is that right, brothers and sisters? All right, now watch it. Let's go to Mark. Go to Mark 13. All right, Mark 13. All right, Mark 13, let me get the verse here. 24. But in those days after the tribulation, what's going to happen? The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that in heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. So Matthew and Mark backs up and says the same thing, right? Let's go to Revelation. We've read Revelation over and over and over again, but let's go to Revelation and read it again. Because John, who wrote the book, St. John, also wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the Revelation. So let's see what he says in Revelation that we've already read many times, but we want to read it again tonight. In Revelation Chapter 6, John says, And I beheld now, verse 12, when he had opened the sixth seal. So we see all this is happening under the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake. So John backs up and gives some more information, gives us the earthquake. And then he says, And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, 
and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casts its untimely time of the figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And then he says, in the heaven apart of the scroll, he gives the same exact sequence. Do we see it, brothers and sisters? Now, we looked at Matthew, we looked at Mark, and we looked at John in the Revelation. Now let's go to look at Luke. Let's go see what Luke says. Now John added one event. He added the, the earthquake. Is that right? Now let's see what does Luke do. In Luke 21, the Bible says, 25, He's given the signs. Now watch what Luke says. And verse 25, are we, there, are we there, saints? And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. He gives those, those three. Then what does he say? And upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity. That... That word, perplexity, comes from a Greek word, A-P-O-R-I-A, apore. And that word, that's 630 in the, in the concordance. That word comes from another word, apore, 629. And the word means there will be a financial crisis. There will be no way out. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? There will be no way out. So John, Luke is saying, after these stars, there's going to be a financial crisis and there will be no way out. We're in it right now. We have no way out of this. What happened in 2008, 2009, saints? It will not be fixed. Are you hearing me, saints? So, right now, we are printing money in America, just running it off the press. And the more you run it off the press, the less of the money in your pocket, the value of your money in your pocket continually goes down. And this is going to continue now until Jesus comes. Now, you know what's going to happen? The people are going to say, we've got to get back to God. That's the only way to fix this. The people are going to say this. Bill Gates is not going to say this. No, the people are going to say this. You see, the people already began to, to rise up. They had Occupy Wall Street. The people are going to say, we've got to get back to God. Now watch. I have to tell you that over the course of several years, I, after I, as I have talked to friends and family and neighbors, when I think about members of my own staff who are in incredibly committed monogamous relationships, same-sex relationships who are raising kids together, when I think about those soldiers or airmen or marines or sailors who are out there fighting on my behalf and yet feel constrained, even now that don't ask, don't tell is gone because they're not able to commit themselves in a marriage at a certain point, I've just concluded that for me personally, it is important for me to go ahead and confirm that I think same-sex couples should be able to get married. Now you might say, well, that, that's, we've had that up here for a while, but not in America. This is a historical event. The lamb-like horn has now completely turned his back on God. This was the found scroll. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Now you better hear me tonight. This is the found scroll for America. This is it. Now you say, well, Brother Mason, how do you know? Let's go to the Bible and see. Are you with me, brothers? You ready to go to the Bible and see? All right, let's go. Now, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to this. Let's pray for that clock. All right, let's go. As Jesus is giving the signs, look what, what does he say? In Luke chapter 17, Looking at verses 26, the Bible says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. 
Let's go to Genesis chapter 6 to see what was going on in the days of Noah. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 5, the Bible says, let's read together. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continual. What does God call evil continual? Let's go to Romans and let's see how you, that's right, you're right, Pastor. Let's see what, was, what were they doing that God would say they're only evil continual. Let's go to Romans chapter 1, verses 24. What does it say? Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed for God ever. Amen. For, the, for this cause, what did God do to them now? For this cause, what did God do? God gave them up to vile affections for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one to another. What? Men with men, working that which is what? Unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was me. So, brothers and sisters, before the flood, the same thing that was going on then is going on now. And for the first time, brothers and sisters, the whole world is embracing this. Do you know that every country is fixing to embrace this now? They're being picked off one by one. All the whole world is embracing this. Let's go. Verse 28. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Let's go to Ezekiel 16, verses 49. Let's see what does Ezekiel 16, 49 says. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. What was it? Pride. What else? 1649, Ezekiel 1649. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. It was pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were, did what? Haughty and did what? committed abomination before me, therefore I took them away as I saw good. They, what, did they, what did they do? They committed abominations before God. Let's go to Genesis 19 to see what kind of abominations were they committing before God. Genesis 19, and there came verse 1. Genesis 19 verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed before him. He bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold, now, my Lord, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Now, they, here the angels come in. God has sent them down there to the scroll place. And Lot sees them. He don't know who they are. He says, listen, come into my house and abide all night. I'll feed you. And the angel said, oh, no, we, we're going to stay in the street all night. And Lot said, oh, no. Oh, no, you can't stay in the street in Sodom. It's, it's not safe. Verse 3, and he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But, verse 4, but before they laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom come past the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Now you understand what this is saying, don't you say? That we may know them. Now the Bible says men from every quarter, both old and young came. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him 
and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Look at verse 8. Behold now, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do you to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they unto the shadow of my roof. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. In other words, they said, we don't want those virgin women. We want those men. Brothers and sisters, this is where we are today. And God says, just as it was in the days of Noah, just as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. God made male and female. He says, be fruitful and multiply. Satan's game plan is to turn man to where he want man and woman to want woman. And then when you see this take place, then you know that the next institution at the beginning is about to take place. A Sunday law is about to happen. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? We are here. We are here, saints. This is not a fairy tale. Look at this thing. Obama on gay marriage, it doesn't weaken families, it strengthens families. What's wrong with this man? He has a reprobate mind. The Holy Spirit, let me tell you something here tonight, brothers and sisters. The Holy Spirit is leaving the earth. As the Holy Spirit is leaving the earth, men are given over to the devil and his influences. That's what it means, a reprobate mind. A mind unable to judge. This demonic possession here, saints. That's what this is. President Obama on Monday defended his view that gay couples should have the right to marry, saying that the country has never gone wrong when it expanded rights and responsibilities to everybody. That doesn't weaken families, that screens families. He told gay and lesbian supporters and others that a fundraiser hosted by singer Ricky Martin and the LGBT, the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Leadership Council. It's the right thing to do. For this cause, God gave them up unto Listen, Look at these. Listen, you, listen, nice looking women, nice looking men, but look, brothers and sisters, don't you understand? And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning the lust one toward another. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is abomination. But they're not looking at what the Bible says. This man, CNN, he's come out, gay. I'm gay, happy and proud. CNN, gay. Now you see where, where Satan is putting them? He's putting them in the limelight. And they are in an influence. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Look at you. Gay, lesbian, gay, senator, gay. Brothers and sisters, and it's, it's an epidemic since since Obama did this, brothers and sisters, I'm not trying to be funny here because this is not funny. But they are now falling out of the closet. This, this, this football, I mean, now this basketball player that came out of the closet, says I'm gay, and Obama calls him and says, now you can be a role model to other young kids that want to come out. A role model? Brothers and sisters, don't you see what this means? Look at these, look at these two ladies. Look at these two guys. President Obama Monday defended his view that gay couples should have the right to marry. God says male and female created he them to be fruitful and multiply. He did not create Adam and Steve. And this is the, the, the gay community. Oh, brothers and sisters, this is serious. I'm, I'm, some things I'm not, I'm not sharing with you tonight. But you're not ready to hear. But I'm going to tell you, it's bad. It's real bad. After President Obama announced his support for same-sex marriage, a group organizing a fundraiser on his behalf, Sutton, had to find a bigger venue. The event featuring the pop singer Pink is, is one of two LGBT organized fundraisers Obama is expected to attend on the West Coast on Wednesday. Brothers and sisters, when he, when he made this announcement, the LBGT held a fundraiser for him. They had to change the venue, and they charged $40,000 a plate and raised $15 million for his re-election campaign. Brothers and sisters. Now, let me tell you something now. 
in America, I think it's American stats, stats. Right now in America, for people over 30, the approval rating is now 53% that approve gay marriage. But under 30, it's 83%. That means 83% of Americans under 30 years old approve gay marriage. Now, what's going to happen in the next two or three years? Don't you understand, brothers and sisters? God cannot allow this to go on much longer. Cannot! Because these younger people are, are, are moving up. They're going to be the leaders. What will the world be like then? And it's, and it's worldwide. Let me tell you something. I can tell you right now. God is rising up off of his seat. And Jesus is saying, Lord, just hold on. Hold on. Because God can't handle this. This is why he destroyed the world in, in the flood. This is why he destroyed Sodom. Brothers and sisters, this is what's going to happen now. Are you hearing me, saints? Lesbians, gay, bisexual, transgender. Satan was exalting that he had succeeded in the base in the image of God and humanity. See, now what he wants, see, brothers and sisters, look. What time is it? My time is up. Lord, I don't want to quit. <laughs> look here. Brothers and sisters, Satan has created a situation in the, where he thinks he's going to lock God's hand. Because, see, let me tell you what's happening. Young kids are being born, and the first thing they know when, after they get up at an age, they want the same sex. So what Satan has done, I don't have time to go into dealing, he has actually changed the DNA. He has actually done this. Now, I don't have time to, tonight to show you how he has done this, but he's used several... Ellen G. White tells us that what Satan does is take men and women of various persuasions and put them together in marriage so that he can better control their offspring. So if he put a man with the tendencies and a woman with the tendencies into marriage, they produce an offspring that are fully gay, are fully lesbian. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Now I'm going to close right here, but we'll come back Friday night. You going to come back Friday night? Look here. Don't you remember when Jacob was, was working for Laman? And, and Laman says, Jacob, I'm going to give you all of the spotted cow. And Laman thought he was being slack because there were no spotted cow. So God, so Laman, Jacob, when the cow came down to, to drink and eat, Jacob put spotted sticks in front of them. And as they made it, they produced spotted cow. And, and Laman recognized that all oh, the cows are spotted. I got to change his wages. So he said, Jacob, I'm going to give you all the plain cow. And Jacob said, fine. He pulled the sticks up. And they produced it plain cow. Now, this was happening while they made it. Now, brothers and sisters, the Bible says that by beholding, we become changed. It is a natural law of the human mind that by beholding, you become changed. What are you looking at? What are you listening to? What are you eating? You got problems? Then you better run to Jesus and do what he says do. Otherwise, you're not going to get the victory. Are you hearing me tonight, brother and sister? There's so much more, brothers and sisters. I didn't get halfway through this tonight. You got to come back Friday. I got to merge them both together on Friday. Do you, want to, do you want to serve Jesus? I mean, do you see this thing tonight, brothers and sisters? Do you want to give your heart to Jesus? Give me some music, my friend. You want to give your heart to Jesus tonight? Do we have some cards in there tonight? I, I, it's time to make commitments, saints. If you have not made a commitment, it's time to make a commitment. This thing is real. How much time do we have left? I can't tell you it's going to be uh, October the 5th, as I told you before, but I can tell you right now, time is very, very short, extremely so.
If you have not made your calling and election sure, brothers and sisters, you need to do it tonight. We have some cards here. First, first one says, I want to be truly committed to Christ. If that's your category, you need to take a card and sign it. I want to be baptized the way Jesus was. And some of you need to be rebaptized. You're hearing things that you've never heard. You need to make a commitment to God tonight. And it's, it's no time to play things. There's no time to reason this out. It's time to do it. I have been baptized but have questions about rebaptisms. Please pray for me. I need help in solving problems. God has answers. I would like a personal visit. I commit myself to obey. And if you're in here tonight and you have not been obeying God's commandments, now is the time. The day that you hear his voice, harden not your heart. And I'll say one thing, brothers and sisters. All of us in here, every one of us, including myself, need to recommit ourselves to God tonight. Every single solitary one of us need to recommit ourselves to God. And I'm going to pray. And in this prayer, you have an opportunity to commit yourself to God tonight forever. Father in heaven, in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, as we seek you in prayer, we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will move upon every heart in here, including mine, Lord. Time is too short. We didn't finish this presentation tonight, Lord, but I tell you, Lord, what we have done, I pray that you will, Lord, fix it in the minds of those that heard it, that they may recognize that time is extremely short. Lord, if there be one here tonight and need to commit themselves to the Lord, we ask you, Lord, to move upon their heart right now, even as we're praying. I'm asking you to raise your hand right now that someone can put a, put a card in your hand. But whatever one of these commitments, and I know you're in here tonight. God has told me you're in here tonight. So put your hand up and let someone put a card in your hand tonight that you want to commit yourself to God. For one of these, I want to be truly committed to Christ. I want to be baptized the way Jesus was. I have been baptized but have questions about rebaptism. Please pray for me. I need help in solving a problem. I would like a personal visit. I commit myself to God to obey God's commandments. Father, please give them the courage to take that step tonight and then walk with them. Even as we're praying, lift your hand. The church is praying. We're in a battle with the devil himself. He does not want people to make this step. He has been fighting since he was kicked out of heaven to prevent people for making a decision to follow you. Lord, I ask you to beat him back tonight and give people freedom freedom of mind, freedom to step forward, freedom to take this step, freedom to exercise, Lord, this faith, this little faith that you've given every one of us. Give them that, Lord, that opportunity tonight. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask that we pray. Is there one? Is there another? Is there another? God is waiting. Heaven is looking on. The angels are looking on. The angels, don't hesitate. Raise your hand right now. Is there another? Is there another? Is there another? Father, please move upon the hearts of the people. There's others in here that need to make a decision tonight. Lord, please. It's in your hands, Father. Church is praying. Is there another? Father, we know there are others. We know there are others. We know there are others. I pray, Lord, they will commit to thee. As we close this prayer, if you will, I pray that, Lord, if there's others here, that they will come down and discuss this situation with us. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for what you've shared with us. We know, Lord, that we're at the end. I plead with you, Lord, that none of us will be lost. Thank you for what you've shared with us this night. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.